Okay, Year 12s. Here is the lucky last poem in your study of Rosemary Dobson, which is very exciting. Um, it's the shortest as well, which we'll be talking about in our analysis today as well. So in the class, we touched on this poem very briefly. I gave you some information about the poet Basho, um, who was a Japanese poet who was around in the 17th century in Japan. And his um, poems were characterised by what was known as haku, and it became it sort of evolved to be known as haiku. So most of you have encountered this type of poem before. Chances are you will have done it in primary school or year seven, um, probably one of your earliest introductions to poetry. Um, so haikus are always made up of three lines and they always have five syllables, seven syllables, five syllables on their respective lines all the time. So it is very significant that we look at this haiku structure um, when we're regarding this particular poem because it's very clear that Dobson was knew um, Basho's poetry and knew that it did conform to haiku structure. And by suggesting that this poem is a long way after Basho, is suggesting that she is experimenting with this particular style and that her poetry is transcending the particular structures that have come before it and that perhaps there's an element of freedom or at least an element of individuality in her poems now. As you will notice that each stanza upon first glance kind of looks like a haiku. It's got three lines and it's got um, pretty distinct syllables within each line. However, when you look at it more closely, we see that this is bastardised, so it's been taken and, and reworked so it fits Dobson's own agenda. So let's have a read through the poem, as we always do, and then we'll have a discussion about what this could possibly mean, why she's done this, all of that kind of thing. Poems a long way after Basho. I breathe the leaves of the basil. It has news for me, for all my senses, old. I strive for wisdom. As the sage bush speaks clearly, many leaved, grey and silver. Solace for my eyesight, the green leaves of borage and its gentle blue flowers. Okay, so she begins the poem um, with a very sensory opening, um, particularly with the sense of smell. Um, when she talks about breathing in the leaves of the basil. Now, this is a picture of a basil plant here. This is probably something, hopefully, most of you are fairly familiar with. It's a pretty common herb that um, people use in lots of types of cooking, particularly things like pasta and pizza and things like that, but certainly not limited to those kinds of things. Um, if you've ever encountered basil, you know it's a very kind of fragrant, fragrant herb, so you can smell um smell it you know as, as it's on the bush and especially when you crush it up as well so um, when she's br breathing in this particular plant she is talking about that particular smell but then she says it has news for me for all my senses now at this particular point in time we know that she's getting quite a bit older and we know that her eyesight is failing a little bit sort of towards the end of her life um, and so things that have a very distinct smell or colour probably would help to overcome this in some way a little bit. Um, so by looking at this, she says, you know, for all my senses, it's a very distinctive green colour. It has a very distinctive smell. She could probably touch it. You can taste it as well, like you can use it in a her as a herb in a cooking. So it is one of those plants that is news for all of her senses. It's something very simple, something very, very common, but that awakes every part of her, which is quite um, a sort of beautiful image in, in its way. In the second stanza, she talks about striving for wisdom, desiring truth and knowledge. And this is something that has been universal across her entire life. We know that. We know that she, she strives for wisdom in every aspect of her life. But there's a little bit of a, a, a hint here, or an implication that as she's become older, that maybe she's searching for a different kind of wisdom. When she was younger, it was a wisdom of what had come before her, of history, of art, of great human achievement, and especially of kind of truth about what life is about. 
um, what happens after we die, all of those kinds of universal things that we've been examining across all of her poetry. Whereas here, there's a sense um, that maybe she has come to realise in her her older age that true wisdom is, is not all of that stuff. Maybe it's something quite different. So as you consider this poem, I really want you to think about what obviously aligns with her previous work. Um, but in particular, compare what has come beforehand, particularly the poems of her youth, with the latter poems of her older age, poems like Reading Aloud, poems like this one, poems A Long Way After Basho, where there's a simplicity within the poems, not of meaning, not suggesting that they have become more simple in their meaning, but definitely a simplicity of structure, of style, and even of the truth that they're aiming to get to the heart of. Um, she has stripped away all of the adornments of her previous poems, all of the flashiness, all of the, the texture and colour that she was sort of going for in previous ones, and she stuck to very, very simple notions but tells a very complex story in this poem. So that's what I'm going to kind of leave you with, um, Year 12s. So I really want you to think about what has um, remained true and constant across all of her poetry, but in particular, how has her perspective on things changed? So we know that she deals with very, very similar themes and concepts across her entire career, but the outcomes of these poems and the outcomes of her musings change. So what do we learn from these? What do we discover and what's revealed about her views and values? based on her poetic journey. Okay, congratulations, you've just finished um, the final poem in the study of Dobson, so hopefully now you'll have some ideas that you can work with and you can bring to class tomorrow about an overall interpretation on certain themes or concepts um, across Dobson's poetry. Thanks very much, Year 12s, we'll see you tomorrow. And finally, definitely don't overlook the punctuation of this poem. Like a lot of her, her previous ones, in the latter part of her life, she eradicates a lot of punctuation. She strips everything back. So just like she has in terms of imagery and conceptual ideas and even structure of her poem, everything is kind of pulled away from what it once was. So she reinvigorates the sense of haiku. She's sort of saying, I'm using the same basic structure as Basho, but I'm moving away from it and I'm making it my own. And there's no full stops within this poem. There's a, there's a hyphen and there's a couple of commas where things slow down, but there's no full stop. So I want you to think about why she may have done that. Is she suggesting that poems are a, a continuing process, that they will continue to evolve and grow? Is she saying that wisdom is, is something equally um, similar, that they, it will continue to grow? Also take care to look at the colour that she utilises within this poem. We have the green of the basil. Not that she um, says green at the beginning, but we know that basil is green. We have the grey and silver of the sage bu um, bush, and we have the, the green and the blue flowers of the borage. Everything's quite soothing. Everything's calm. So if you were descri um, I'd be definitely thinking about having adjectives to describe those colours and how those those colours transfer into a, into a feeling or a tone um, that sweeps across this particular poem. Um, so before we finish up, um, we've had a look at this concept that the final stanza has this element of solace, um, and again, it's moving away from from the grandeur of her earlier works, the grandeur of the, the light and the colour and the artwork that she so admired when she was younger, and has paired all of that back to look at the simple truths of life, that sometimes the greatest happiness can come from the most mundane, everyday things, that maybe the greatest wisdom that she talks about here comes from living life across a whole span of different experiences and then coming back and recognising that it's the more simple things that, that mean the most. Perhaps that's um, one thing that we need to look at. And then this brings us to the final stanza of this poem and of course of all of her poems that we're going to be studying um, so far. Uh, when she talks about solace for my eyesight, so the word solace brings to mind 
words of comfort, peace, serenity, soothing, all of these kinds of con um, concepts. So solace for my eyesight, it's a place of peace, it's a pe place of harmony. They soothe my eyes by looking at, um, at this particular um, plant. And she says, um, the green leaves of borage and its gentle blue flowers. And this is a borage plant here, um, which we can look at. So obviously the plant itself gives her great peace. And again, it's very, very simple. She's looking at flowers in her garden and she's breathing them in and, and generating a sense of peace from them. We also, of course, can draw parallels between grey and silver of the bush um, with the grey and silver of growing old. You know, um, our hair grows grows grey as we get older um, and in some ways we become, it becomes a little bit more of a simple version of ourselves um, where all of the things that concerned us when we were younger are kind of stripped away a little bit as we get older. We don't care so much about the things that were considered really, really important when we're, when we're younger. And I think she touches upon that, particularly in the latter half of her poetry, where she kind of maybe embraces those simple things a little bit more and moves away from the, the superficial beauty of some of her previous poems and the artwork that she explores in them. So then when she starts to say, I strive for wisdom as I get older, and she looks at the sage bush, which is this um, bush here, and as she says, many leaved grey and silver, and it has a sort of purple flower. It looks a little bit like lavender, but it's probably a little bit more plentiful than lavender. Um, and she says it speaks clearly. Now, I definitely would look into this word sage. Sage can mean wisdom. Um, if you are a, a very sage person, you're very wise, you, you understand the world. Um, is she deliberately going for that parallel there, I think definitely there's, there's things to be explored there within this bush. And definitely looking at the many-leaved aspect of it, um, is she, she suggesting that wisdom is plentiful, that wisdom comes in many different forms, maybe that there's not one true strand of wisdom, that there's multiple? There's lots of things that you could explore as possibilities there.